Testing? No, it's on. Hello. Okay, so I know that I'm the only thing that's standing between you and lunch now, so I'm going to get right into it, because like Rachel said, I don't want to keep you uh, more than 15 minutes today. It's going to be intense, it's going to be a little bit fast. I'll try to not be fast, but even when I think that I'm not being fast, everybody tells me that I am being fast, so no promises. Okay, so the gap between uh, what, between what's possible in print design and graphic editors like Photoshop and what's possible on the web has been getting smaller and smaller over the last few years. But the thing is, it has always been small. It's just taken us years and years to realize or to pay attention to the parts of the web that have made this gap smaller. Now, when it comes to CSS in particular, over the last few years it has seen a few additions that have made this gap a little bit smaller, starting with CSS shapes, which allow us to create non-rectangular layouts uh, on the web. And then we had blend modes that allow us to blend content together, blend images with colors, blend text with another text, blend uh, any element on the page with another element. And then we have CSS filters that enable us to, to do even more image uh, editing right in the comfort of our code editors. Now, when it comes to filters, there are 11 filter effects possible in CSS that do a range of effects from brightness control to contrast, grayscale, mostly color manipulation on mostly images. One particularly interesting effect is the URL effect. Ooh, first time I'm using the spotlight, cool. Is the URL effect which allows us to import SVG filters from SVG to apply them to either SVG filters or HTML elements on the page. Now, it is true that CSS, made has, uh, that CSS has made the gap smaller, especially with the introduction of uh, features like CSS filters, but SVG has had these features and a lot more for, for almost two decades now. Now, in fact, CSS filters are imported from SVG. They are fairly more optimized versions or shortcuts of other SVG filters. Uh, SVG filters are way more powerful and can do a lot more than CSS filters can do. For example, it is currently possible, possible to blur an object using the blur CSS function. In the image above here, we're blurring the image by an amount of six pixels. Uh, this creates a uniform blur effect that, that is equally applied along the x-axis and the y-axis. So you're not seeing any one-directional blur here. But this function is extremely limited compared to its original father, which is the, uh, which is the SVG Gaussian blur filter primitive. Now, this SVG filter primitives allows us to not only apply a uniform blur effect to images or to any object, but it also allows us to specify a different blur uh, radius along the x-axis or the y-axis, or you can even cancel out one of them and only do one directional blur blurring. Now, this combined with other filter effects in SVG allows us to create uh, motion blur effects and among many other things. Now, before I start getting into SVG filters, the question that pops up most of the times is why? Why would you want to apply graphical effects to web content on the web? Why don't we, suppose you have an image that has a lot of effects on it, and why don't you just create it in Photoshop, export it and embed it on the page? Wouldn't that be easier? Well, the question is, okay, maybe easier at first, yes, but there are many reasons why having these effects in the browser is, is much better. First of all, in today's web, we can't just deal with one image. If you're building responsive websites and applications, which you should be doing, then you're probably going to be dealing with more than one image for every image. So you're going to be creating 1x, 2x, 3x, multiple resolutions for every image. And if you, if you at some point decide to change the effect on that image, you're going to have to change it for every version of it. You're going to have to update them all, and that's going to get tedious with time. But having an effect done in the browser has also much more, uh, much more uh, benefits other than the resolution independence. The first one is the content semantics are preserved. So the ability to apply a filter effect on the web helps to maintain the semantic structure of the document instead of resorting to high, instead of resulting to images which, aside from being resolution independent, they tend to obscure the original semantics of the elements they replace. And this is particularly true for text if you're using an image to replace text. The content is also editable and dynamic on the web. It is easier and faster to tweak and change using just a couple of lines of code versus having to do it in Photoshop for every single image resolution. And the effects are animatable. Most effects on the web are applied using some sort of mathematics and there are numbers involved. Numbers are animatable, so the effects are animatable. You cannot animate effects, static effects generated using Photoshop. Now, filters are created in SVG using the filter element. 
Filter elements are never rendered directly. They, their only usage is something that can be referenced using the filter property on an element. Such elements, elements that are usually defined somewhere and then applied or called on elements, are usually wrapped inside of a devs element. But whether or not you wrap the filter element in a devs, it doesn't matter because it's not going to be displayed anyway. The reason for that is that the filter re requires a source image to work on. And unless you define a source image and then call the filter on that source image, it's, it's not going to have anything to render and so it's not going to render. So you can define it inside of defs or you can skip that, it's your call. Um, now a filter effect is made up of a series of operations that are applied to a given source graphic to produce a modified graphical result. So in SVG, this is just an example, you don't need, you don't need to read the code. Each filter element contains a set of filter primitives as its children. All filter primitives in SVG are, are prefixed FE. So we have FE merge, FE component transfer, FE flood. FE is short for filter effect. The result of one filter primitive can be used as an input to another filter primitive. And since we have about 20 filter primitives, I think, and you can use input from one, uh, result of one to, uh, as an input to another one, there are almost an endless combination that you can come up with, and so an endless combination of effects. This in turn means, uh, that, well, SVG is much more powerful than CSS, I've already mentioned that. Now, before diving into examples and code, there is one more concept that I want to go through really quick, and that is the filter region. The set of filter operations that you see, that you saw, or, or that you're going to create at some point, they need a region to be applied to. So suppose you have an SVG that contains multiple elements, and you only want to apply those filters to one or two or a few elements inside of that SVG. The browser needs to know where to apply it, so you need to define a region for it. Now, each element in SVG has a small region whose boundaries are defined by the borders of the bounding box. The bounding box in SVG is, the, is a concept that is similar to the concept of a um, of a box model in CSS. So every element in CSS have a width and a height, and those define the box model made up of margin, the margin box, content box, border box, etc. We don't have, we don't have um, box models in SVG, but when you have a non-rectangular element and you need to know the width and the height of that element and its position relative to the entire SVG, you need some sort of rectangular thing around it, and that is called the bounding box. So for example, this piece of text here, the smallest fitting rectangle looks like the pink rectangle in this image, even though, although if you have any line, line height for the text, that is going to be taken into account when defining the bounding box. Now by default, the filter region is going to be the bounding box of an element. So if you apply any effect to this text, the effect will be restricted to this rectangle here. And any filter result, filter result on the text that lies beyond the boundaries of the bounding box is going to get clipped off. This makes sense, but is also not very practical because as it happens, many filter effects are going to affect pixels outside the bounding box. And an example of that is the blur effect. So this is what happens when the text is blurred. You can see that the blurring is, being, uh, is cut off here on the left and on the right side. Okay, this is not desirable. So according to the specification, it is often necessary to provide padding space in the filter region because the filter effect might impact bits slightly outside the tight-fitting bounding box on a given object. For these purposes, it is possible to provide negative percentage values for X and Y, as well as percentage values above 100% on the width and height of the filter. So a filter, you can define the region of that filter and the position on using X, Y, width and height on the filter element. So if we were to visualize the filter region area in case of the uh, text here, you're going to find out that indeed, by default, Browsers are going to be adding this, these, these exact values to the filter regions by default. So even if you don't extend the filter region, the browser is going to add an amount of 10% on each side as, as internal padding to your filters. Now, in order to visualize, I'm going to start with the first two filters here. In order to visualize the filter region, you can apply a color, like a background color, to that region. And that can be done using the flood filter primitive. The flood primitive literally floods the filter region with a color specified in the flood color attribute. Hence the name, but the color will cover everything. Again, that's why it's called flood, because it's gonna flood, it's gonna be covering everything. So in order to make it behave like a background image, you'll want to move the background or the flood layer to the back and then display the source image on top of it again. Uh, this is what merge is used for. Um, it, is, it merges effects together. So in this case, we're merging the flood result, with the, uh, with our, uh, which is our color, with the source graphic, which is our text. 
Um, inside of FE merge, you're going to have merge nodes, and these merge nodes are literally layers. Uh, the first one is going to be in the back, and the last one is going to be on top of, every, uh, of all the other ones. Uh, so you can override the default filter region, as I mentioned before, by using the X, Y, width, and height attributes on the filter element. But you need to keep something in mind. Units used, whether you're using percentages or fractions, they are, they are, the units you use depend on the filter, uh, sorry, depend on, uh, going blank here. On which filter units value is in use. So if I, okay, I already have it here. So we have a filter units, uh, uh, attribute, it is by default the user space unused. The user space unused means that you're going to be using the user coordinate on the entire SVG. Okay, so if you specify X, Y, width and height with a user space unused being used, then these pixels here, 5 pixels, 500 pixels, are going to be used relative, uh, relative to the entire SVG coordinate system. But if you set the bounding box of an element to be the coordinate system, then you're going to have to use, and then if you use percentages, those are going to be relative to the bounding box of the element. So if you're using pixels, they're going to be reference uh, relative to the user space on use unless you specify otherwise, percentages likewise. Now with these covers, with these covered, let's start with an example. The first and the most common example that you're, that you're going to find in most uh, tutorials online that teach you about SVG filters is how to create a drop shadow because drop shadows require multiple steps and therefore multiple filter primitives to create and it so happens that the primitives used are of the simplest primitives. So we're going to start with the simplest ones and then we're going to end up with creating texture and lighting effects. So this is what we're going to be creating. So in order to create a drop shadow in SVG, you start with the FE offset filter primitive. It takes in the source alpha as uh, the, the FE offset offsets the input image relative to its current position in the image space uh, specified in the vector. Now, and the vector, I'm sorry, Whew, starting to blank out. So in here, the in attribute tells the filter primitive to take the source alpha of the image. The source alpha is the alpha channel of an image. And since an image is a JPEG image, it doesn't have any transparency, it's going to be a black version, a black copy of the image. So we're copying the black version of the image here. We're moving it by 20 pixels by 20 pixels horizontally and vertically because we want the drop shadow to be 20 pixels by 20 pixels offset. And then we, ap we apply the Gaussian blur using the Gaussian blur uh, filter primitive with a standard deviation 10 uh, and CSS uh, the CSS equivalence would be filter blur 10 pixels. And the result is a layer that we're going to call drop shadow. Now, next up, we want to color that drop shadow. Now, by default, it's going to be black because the source alpha is black. In order to color it, I'm going to be flooding the entire area, the filter region, with a light gray color. And I'm calling this color layer color. And then I'm using the FE composite function, in order to, which takes in the color layer as, L, as well as our drop shadow. It uses the in operator in order to composite the color and the drop shadow together, resulting in a shadow. Now first, quick recap of compositing. Compositing is the combining of a graphic element with its backdrop. So a backdrop is the content behind the element and it is what, is, what the element is compo composited with. Now there are, um, compositing defines how, what you, how what you want to draw will be blended with what is already drawn on the canvas. Now there are different composite operations, there are 16. In our case, the drop shadow, we're going to be using the N, destination N here. So when we composite the flood, which is covering the entire area here, no, not here, in the back, oops, okay. So if we're going to be compositing a color that is covering the entire SVG in our case, and then with a drop shadow that has a specific amount, it is, it, it's specific dimensions, it's not covering the entire SVG, when you're compositing them using the in composite operation, only the part where these two overlap will be displayed, and the part where these two overlap is our drop shadow. And since you're compositing them together, you're applying the color of the flood to the drop shadow and ending up with a color drop shadow. And then we're using FE merge again to merge our shadow result with the source graphic, which is our initial graphic. So we can display it on top of our drop shadow again. And this is how you create a drop shadow in SVG. 
It is not nearly as simple as CSS, but these filter primitives are literally one of some of the simplest in SVG. Another simple primitive available is FE morphology, the morphology primitive. Now, to morph means to transform the form or the shape of an object. The morphology filter operates on the form of an object and provides two specific shape transformations. Erosion, which is thinning or shrinking, and dilation, which means thickening or expanding. So using this filter primitive, you can either expand or shrink an element. That can be text, that can be an image, that can be anything. In more technical terms, both these operations operate on a pixel level, expanding a pixel into its neighboring pixels, which is dilation, or crumbling the neighboring pixels at the edges of the pixel being operated on, while still maintaining strokes around the edge of that pixel. The amount by which a pixel is dilated or the number of neighboring pixels used to stretch or expand the pixel upon is determined by the radius parameter. So the morphology has multiple attributes. The first one is n. You define what you're going to be morphing. The result is what you're calling the end result. The operator, it's either dilate or erode. So you're either expanding or shrinking. And then there is a radius which defines by the amount by which you want to dilate or uh, shrink. Now, when applying the erosion or dilation effect to an image, this is the kind of effects that it would generate. Morphology applied to images has two effects that are usually predictable. Um, the image dimensions get smaller or larger because you're shrinking or dilating. It may be visible to some of you here in the examples here. And the image, the resulting image is going to look like it's been painted with a large painting brush with not a lot of lines and fine detail in it. This is also visible in the images here as well. Now, in addition to the shrinking and expanding effect, probably the first thing you'll notice is the different colors resulting from each of these two images, um, these two effects. Now, indeed, erode produces an effect that has more darker pixels, and dilate produces lighter outputs. Though so this is due to the fact that, this is uh, also more um, technical stuff here. Erode sets each pixel to its darkest most or most transparent neighbor, whereas dilate sets each channel of each pixel to match the brightest or least transparent value from its neighbors. So in short, without getting into too much detail, technical details here, dilate or shrink, darken or lighten, you're going to end up with painting stroke, stroke effects on images. This is very predictable. Now, for single color objects, if you don't have an image, if you just have text, for example, text is going to have one single color applied to it. Erode makes the object thinner and dilate makes it thicker. It's as simple as that. We can take advantage of this fact to create external outlines to text that give us more desirable results than those that we would get when using stroke to add an outline. For example, suppose we have this text here. This is what the text looks like when using an SVG stroke, the second line, and when it is outlined using an SVG morphology filter in the third line here. When applying an outline with the stroke attributes, you're applying that outline at the expense of the text itself getting thinner. It's practically that you're taking a part of that thickness from the text itself and using that as an outline. That is not desirable. But this is not really, um, you know, this is not the effect that you're after. So, Ideally, you'd be able to preserve the thickness of the text and add an outline to it, and that can be done using an SVG filter. But the code is a little bit more required than that when using stroke. So if you're applying the stroke, you just add the stroke, you define the color, and then you specify the stroke width, and you're done. But the effect is not very desirable. So to create an outline using SVG filters, the code would look more like this. So we're starting with FE morphology. We're taking in the source alpha, I, wanna, I want you to remember this part here. We're taking the alpha channel of the text. So the input is black, okay? We're calling the result dilated. We're using dilate because we want to expand it. And then we're giving it a radius three, which means that the outline is going to be three pixels wide. Then we're using the FE flood with a specific color, in our case, deep pink. Flood opacity, one, you can change that, and result pink. We're compositing the pink color with the dilated text, and the result is called recolored. And then we're merging that recolored text with our source graphic. So, you have dilated the text, you've made it wider, you have colored it, and then, so you, you end up with the exact same text, wider, with a different color, and then you're adding the original text on top of it again. So you literally have two layers on top of each other, and well, that is all you need. But we can take this further and create outline-only text by adding a composite operation to cut out the inside part of the text, 
and only leave out the outline. So we get an effect that looks like this. And this is really nice because you can have any kind of background behind it. If the background changes, the text of the color changes, this is really good. This, uh, this text here is known, sorry, oh, sorry. This text is known as knockout text, where the background is showing through. So if the background color changes, so does the text as well. Now, I said something. I said the text here, the inside of the text is cut out. In fact, the code to achieve this might sound a little bit longer, uh, might sound like it's longer than it is, but in fact, it's, it doesn't have to be. So here's a tip. The trick here, um, okay, let me just I have to read the code over and over again because, you know, it's even, even though I've been working with filters for, for months now, I still have to remember the steps here. So uh, what I'm doing here is FE morphology, FE morphology, operate or dilate, radius, 8 pixels, whatever, you can change that, in source graphic. What has changed here? Exactly. So. In the previous example, I was morphing, I was taking the alpha channel of the text, which is by default black, and then I was expanding it and then putting the text on top of it. But every time you wanted to change the color of the outline on that text, because you're using an alpha channel, you're going to have to use a flood color, blend it and composite it with the dilated text, and then put the source text on top of it again, and that's how you get. So every time you want to change the color of the outline, you're going to have to jump into the filter, use a flood color to do that. That is not very ideal, but if you use the source graphic, which is the text itself, as an input, and then you cut it out using FE Composite here, so you have the expanded text in the back, and then you have the text on top of it, you cut out the area in the middle by using the composite function, and you end up with the outline. But that outline is actually the text that is being dilated because I'm using source graphic. So I have the dilated text that is empty in the middle, and if I want to change the color of that outline, I have to change the color of the source graphic, which is the text. And the color of the text can be changed using the fill, element, the fill attribute or the, or the fill property in CSS, which means that changing the color of our text outline is going to be much easier and done in CSS because you get the separation of concerns. All good? <laughs> I know that was too much, a little bit, but you haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> Next, I want to talk about applying texture, or more specifically, how you can use an image of a texture any texture and use it to change the shape sometimes in three, dimension, in three dimensions, but not really 3D because we don't have 3D in, CS, in SVG yet. You can use an image of a texture to change the shape and texture of other elements. In our case, we're going to be doing it with text. In particular, I want to create this effect that I borrowed from a Photoshop tutorial that I found on YouTube because I'm not a designer and I have no clue how to create this in Photoshop. Now, in the video, my goal from this exercise here was to see if I can recreate every single step in Photoshop using SVG filters, because that is the whole point. I mean, I said at the beginning of the talk that SVG filters allow us to do Photoshop stuff in the browser. So let's see how true that is. So in the video, the designer cre created the effect using what is known as a displacement map. A displacement map is an image whose color information is used to distort the content of another element. In SVG filter terms, the displacement map filter primitive uses the pixel values from the image that you give it as input to displace the image from the other input. So you have N and you have N2, but you don't have N3 or N4, just N and N2. So some filters take two inputs, and this is one of them. In Photoshop, the steps to create that effect are as follows. You desaturate the image, the designer desaturates the image, Reduce the amount of detail in it by blurring it by one pixel. Why? Because if the texture has too much detail in it, the result is not going to be too realistic. If it has too little detail in it, it's not going to be realistic either. So you blur it by one pixel, which is just enough. You save that image, the blurred image, as a displacement map. And then you create the text. You apply a distortion filter using the image as a displacement map. This is all designer stuff in Photoshop. You reuse the original image as a background behind the text and then refine the effect a little bit more by adding trans slight transparency, maybe blending, um, stuff like that. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six steps. In SVG terms, it looks almost exactly the same, which is good. 
So let's translate that to code and see the result of each step. The first one, Phil. Fill the filter region area with the image that will be used as a texture using the FE image. So we, we need a texture, so you start with using that texture, applying it inside of the filter. Desaturate the image using the color matrix with the type or the value saturate, which is a shortcut for another matrix. So instead of you having to write the matrix yourself, you have the saturate shortcut. You apply a one pixel Gaussian blur to the image using Gaussian blur filter effect. Use the image to distort the text using the displacement map effect. Blend the text into the background image using FE blend and apply a translucent effect to it, decrease the opacity using FE component transfer or FE matrix again to make the effect look more realistic. And then you display the text and the image behind it by merging the two layers using FE merge. So we're gonna start again. So we have an image. You link to your image, whatever that image is. Preserve aspect ratio is, this is me just telling the image to be stretched out to fill the entire SVG area. I don't care about the aspect ratio here because it's just a texture, it doesn't need to be pixel perfect. And then I start by desaturating the image using FE color matrix, type saturate, values zero, result is our desaturated image. Next step, decrease the level of the details using the FE Gaussian blur, standard deviation 0 0.5, it could be one. Uh, in Photoshop, we did a one pixel blur, but in this case here, after a little bit, a little bit of tri trial and error, I ended up with 0 0.5 because that is what, uh, what made the effect more realistic. And this is what I have so far. Next, I'm using that texture as a displacement map. I'm taking in the source graphic, which is my text. I'm also taking the map. I'm using both. Uh, there is a scale, X channel select selector. These are outside of the scope of this talk. They just... Um, they regulate or determine how the texture is going to be applied because the texture has color information, so which channels you want to use to distort the text, you specify them here. And then, using the color matrix, so this is a matrix here, okay? R, G, B, A, and with the columns we have the same thing, R, G, B, A. So this column here and this one here where, where I have the 0 0.9, this is the alpha, the opacity, uh, the alpha channel of the entire image. So if I change it from 1 to 0 0.9, I'm decreasing the opacity of the text. And this is what I have so far. Now I need to add that texture again as a background. But before I do that, I'm doing an extra step here, which is not really necessary. I'm using another, compo another filter effect, which is the component transfer. It comes with multiple types, gamma, discrete, linear, and table. I, I told you this is a uh, technical talk. Gamma, discrete, linear, and table. I'll get into more examples later in the last section, but it, is, it suffices to know at this point that gamma can be used to control intensity and the contrast of the colors. So increasing the amplitude, we have amplitude and exponent as, well, okay, this is the type. Amplitude and exponent, uh, I thought there was a third attribute. No, there isn't. Increasing the amplitude value increases the intensity of the colors. White becomes whiter and darker shades become lighter. The exponent value affects the dark areas of the image. Increasing it intensifies the dark areas and decreasing it lightens the dark areas so you end up with more of a washed color effect. This is where the effect of contrast is more obvious. So I'm increasing both of them so that lighter becomes the light, uh, white becomes whiter, dark becomes darker, and this is my texture now. And then I'm blending it. I'm blending the text with the texture using a blend mode in SVG. I'm using the multiply in this case, and then I'm merging the two layers together to get this result. Mm. Thank you. And credit where credit is due, this is the Photoshop tutorial that I stole this effect from. Even the texture itself. I, just, I literally took a screenshot of the texture in Photoshop and then used that. Um, filters can also generate texture. So not only can you import a texture and then use that to distort stuff, you can also generate rich textures that can be done using turbul the turbulence. The turbulence primitive generates and renders Perlin noise. I know many of you are already familiar with what Perlin noise is. This kind of noise is useful in simulating several natural phenomena like clouds, fire, smoke, and in generating complex texture like marble or granite. You can create all of these textures using SVG alone. Like FE flood, 
FE Turbulence fills a rectangle, the entire filter region, with new content. Now, in this section, I'm going to go over how we can create noise with FE Turbulence and how that noise can first be used to distort other elements, such as text or images. And then we're going to see how we can use the noise generated by FE Turbulence with lighting effects, also part of SVG filters, in order to generate texture, uh, more particularly rough paper. So the turbulence filter syntax looks like this. It comes with five main attributes uh, that affect the generated texture. Most of the times there are only three attributes that you need to worry about, the type, the base frequency, and the num octaves. Uh, the base frequency specifies the grain of the noise. Very low values, and I mean really very low values, such as 0.001 will produce large patterns, and very high values, such as 0.5, will produce tiny patterns. Values in the range 0.02 to 0.2 uh, are, useful uh, point, are useful starting points for most of the textures. There are two types of noise. I want you to remember this. Turbulence, which is the default noise, and fractal noise. And expect me to say fractal noise in a completely... I just can't say it multiple times in a row, and I have to say it multiple times in a row, so it's going to be a mess. Uh, there's also fractal noise, which has a more cloudy and smooth pattern. Num octaves, we're going to see examples in a second. Num octaves is short for the number of octaves, also remember this, which represents the level of detail in a noise. The higher the number of octaves, just like in music, the higher the level of details. So these 12 images represent 12 different results of noise that can, that can be created using FE turbulence. You can create much many, many more. So the first one, A, we're using a base frequency 0.04. This is just a starting point. We increase the detail level in B by increasing the number of octaves to 2. C is the same as B, but we change the C to 201. C is outside the scope of this talk again. D is the same as C. I, I could give a three-hour talk on SVG filters. Yeah. <laughs> F is we're decreasing the base frequency to 0.01. Um, and that will create larger patterns. It's literally like zooming into, like if you have a noise and you decrease the, the, the base frequency, you're zooming into a part of that noise, so it looks like you have a larger pattern. G and H show, difference, show the difference in number of octaves and the detail levels. I and J show fractal noise, so it is more cloudy in this case. If you compare uh, A and B to I and J, it is very obvious what the difference is, just by changing from turbulence to fractal noise. And K and L show that you can change the size of the pattern along the X and Y axis. So you can produce noise that is either only horizontal or only vertical. These can be used to create some really nice effects that already have been created. I'm going to show you some examples. First, this is an online interactive demo that you can play with. So you can select a, the turbulence just so you can get an idea of what these things uh, do. It is generating a turbulence here. Uh, it is fractal noise in our case. It uses the turbulence here. Oh, I already moved. It uses the turbulence as a displacement map to that image. Okay. You can also choose text, and you can apply the turbulence as a displacement map to text. Can you start imagining the kind of effects that you can create using these? So one of the effects is this water watercolor splash effect. It was created by Dirk Weber, and it is part of an article on Smashing Magazine. Uh, turbulence can also be animated. So. Again, you don't need to read this. I'm only defining multiple filters. Each filter has a turbulence defined inside of it and then used as a displacement map, okay? Uh, I have multiple uh, turbulence effects used as multiple displacement maps and then using CSS, using CSS animations, I am applying a different turbulence to this text at a time over a specific period of time. So I'm essentially animating between these. So we can get an effect like this, squiggly, squiggly text. And animating turbulence can produce much more interesting effects, like these. Um, these have been created on CodeDrops, my absolute favorite website on the internet. So the first one, if you click on it, this is turbulence being animated. Second one, ripple effect as well. Third one, my favorite is the last one there. This is vertical turbulence. Okay, this is pretty awesome. Now, what I want to shed the light on in this section, literally, is how you can use the noise generated from the turbulence filter with the lighting effects 
lighting effect filters in SVG to create a texture that you can then also use as a displacement map or you can just display it or use it any way you want. One fairly simple example texture created with turbulence and lighting is rough paper. Um, this texture requires literally only two steps, two filter primitives to create, but it's a matter of playing with the attributes for these two filter primitives, a little bit of trial and error. So first we're going to start by creating the base for this whole effect with the turbulence primitive. Uh, I'm starting with the something completely random. I'm using base frequency 0.04 just as starting point. I have no idea how that's going to look like yet. The result is noise. Uh, this is what the noise looks like in our SVG. So this is our SVG filter region. This is the Perlin noise that was generated. Next, we need to shine a light on that surface. Shining a light on a graphic provides additional depth and texture. And to create a lighting effect, you need to specify three things. A light color, specified using the light color attribute, and you have the light type. There are two different types of light in SVG. The diffuse lighting, which is very similar to, it is a very distant light, sort of like the sun. If you need the, the effect of a sunlight, you can use diffuse lighting. And there is peculiar lighting, with, which is more like a lamp here. Both primitives shine light on an object or image by using the alpha channel of that image as a bump map. Transparent values remain flat, while opaque values rise to form peaks that are illuminated more prominently. To rephrase, a light source filter uses an input's alpha channel to provide depth information. Higher opacity areas are raised towards the viewer, and lower opacity areas recede away from the viewer. In other words, the alpha value of a pixel in the input, image or whatever, or noise in our case, is used as a... Um, the alpha value of a pixel in the input is used as the height of that pixel in the z dim dimension, and the filter uses that height to calculate a virtual surface and then shed a light on that surface. Now, because Fe turbulence generates an alpha channel full of noisy values that range from 0 to 1, it produces a very nice variable z terrain that creates highlights when we shine our light on it. Now, after deciding on the type of light that you want, you also need to specify the type source. Um, you can get into these later, they're not really, we don't really get, need to get into them in this talk here. Now, if we go back to our previous light and apply a light effect to it, it would look like this. So we start with the turbulence, um, define that, and then we define a diffuse lighting, which is more like a sunlight, and then with the distant light, azimuth, this is all technical stuff on where you are uh, putting the light and how you are the directing at the angle and all of that stuff. So with this code, we have this result. Now I can see there's too much sharp edges, so we need to smooth the noise out. How do we smooth the noise out? No, not blur. I don't, I don't need a third filter primitive here. Already what I have. What's that? Yeah, <laughs> exactly, the different type of noise, which is the fractal noise. The fractal noise pr produces the more cloudy effect, the smoother effect. So if we switch the type from turbulence to fractal noise, it looks cloudier, which is much better. But rough paper is called rough paper for a reason, so we need a little bit more detail in it. How do we increase the number of details for the noise? Num octaves, exactly. Increasing the number of octaves, bravo, bravo Luz, Bruce. So increasing the number of octaves is going to increase the number, um, the, the amount of details. Um, general information quick tip, five octaves is usually the highest you will need. The effect of a, of a sixth, sixth octave is usually not noticeable, so you can get up to five and that would be the most um, you, would, you could ever need. Now, if we add that, this is what our rough paper looks like. It looks much better. Now we can change the effect a little bit more and tweak it a little bit more. For example, if you play with the source and the distant, uh, distance of the light, uh, decreasing the elevation of the light, for example, bringing it closer, can give us something like this. Um, this is also still okay, but it is getting closer to sandpaper because it is too rough in our case. So the previous version, previous version looks much better. And this is a demo. This is all you need to create simple rough paper texture using SVG filters. Now, you can create a myriad of different effects. If you create turbulence, noise, okay, you're gonna have 
uh, random alpha channels, random colors, random noise positions, everything. And if you start playing with those, for example, you can use component transfer, the component transfer filter effect, uh, or other, ma um, like matrix, for example, you can cancel out colors, you can sharpen colors using uh, Convolve matrix. Convolve matrix is the most complex of all effects, at least that's what I found, and I think you can use Convolve matrix to create your own filter effects. And it, it has been way outside of my league so far. I haven't tried to understand it completely yet. So these are just a few examples of what you can do. So you generate some noise, you can cancel out some colors, you can sharpen colors. I can see us getting close to clouds in some of these, bouquet, maybe a little bit of fireworks if you work your way more into it. The sky is the limit. Now, before we end this talk, I want to give a short overview of two primitives that enable you to manipulate the colors and color channels of objects and images. The first one is, uh, more specifically, I'll be giving two examples. We'll be using the component transfer primit uh, uh, filter primitive again to manipulate the f different color components of images. Uh, we've mentioned one type, which is the gamma, but I want to use another type to create a poster effect like this one. Now, if you use component transfer with a discrete type, the code would look something like this. Discrete reduces the number of colors in an image and shows more sudden color changes which look more like the image is made up of colors, uh, colors, uh, color bands. So you don't have smooth transitions anymore, you have color bands. For every color shade, you're mapping the colors to an X number of ranges depending on how many values you provide in the table value. So in our case here, table values, you're providing three numbers regardless of what these numbers are. Since you're providing three numbers, the browser is going to, for every color channel, it is going to split it into three equal ranges, okay? So in our case, it's, we have table values 0, 0 0.51. The range is, this is my handwriting on a tablet. It's not nearly as nice as it is, as it is in real life, I promise. So we have three ranges, 0 0.03 equal ranges. So 0, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.6, and 0 0.6, 0 0.1. The shades of red are in the ranges 0 to 1 in all of these ranges. You have all kinds of shades of red. Starting from the 0, the darkest, to 1, the lightest. Now, when you're providing these three numbers here, you, what you're essentially saying is only the shade 0 and the shade 0 0.5 and the shade or the intensity 1 of red are on and the others are off. So what the browser does, it does a mapping. So every sh shade of color between 0 and 0 0.3 is being mapped to 0 and everything between 0 0.3 and 0 0.6 is mapped to 0 0.5. So instead of a wide range of red, you end up with only three intensities of red. And if you apply that to G, green, and blue channels as well, you can imagine how the effect looks like. So I chose a very red image here on the left, and I applied that effect discrete, discrete the, same, uh, the same snippet to it. And this is what it looks like on the right. Much fewer red. Okay, one more thing that you can do with component transfer that I've already mentioned a little bit before, which is con uh, contrast control. I want to combine that to also do another type of mapping, similar to the one I did now, but a little bit different, to create duotone effects. Now, this is the last section, I promise. To create a duotone effect in Photoshop, you usually go through two steps. You turn the image into grayscale, you map the grayscale range, black to white or zero or white to black, into a new range that instead of having black and white on either end, it has two different colors that you want to use in the duotone effect. In other words, you will need to use a gradient map that the browser will use to map your black and white to. Now in SVG, to create the gradient map, we can use component transfer again, but in order to map your colors to a range of colors, not to three specific or discrete colors, you're gonna need to use the another type, which is the table type. So suppose you want to create a duotone image effect using the two colors here. Again, this is my really bad handwriting. So I have pink and I have yellow, some uh, intensity of yellow. Now, these colors, if you're working in a graphics editor, uh, are, every color is made up of R, G, and B, and the R, G, and B values usually are in the range between zero and 255. And the values that you provide in the component transfer function have to be in the range zero to one. So for each color, you go grab the RGB values here, you divide them by 255, and you end up with three values, funk for the R, for the G, for the B channels. 
And if you go again into your SVG, FE component transfer, the type in our case is table, so that you can map a range to another range instead of a range to discrete values. Table values here, the first color, these three, R, G, B, are the R, G, B for the pink, and the second three here are the R, G, B for the yellow. And this is all you need to tell the browser, okay, first there's the step here on top. What I'm doing is I'm using the FE color matrix to turn the image into a shade of gray. Essentially, uh, usually to turn an image into grayscale, you need to make sure you have equal amounts of R, G, and B, and this is exactly what I'm doing in the matrix on uh, above. Turn it to grayscale, uh, specify a gradient map, and the browser is going to map the black and white to this, so you end up with this result here. Now, this looks okay, and you can use any colors that you want, but the image could use a little bit of tweaking. In particular, it would, be, it would look a lot nicer if the light colors were lighter and the darkers were a little bit darker. So we can use that, you can, we can fix that using which filter effect? Component transfer. So again, with the type gamma, which as I mentioned uh, earlier, controls the contrast and intensity of the image. So increasing the exponent makes the darker areas darker, while increasing, increasing the amplitude turns the lighter areas into lighter areas. So I'm increasing both in this case, and we end up with this. So to compare it quickly with the, what we had before, we had this, which looked a little bit pale, and then now we have this. Now, if I go back here, you may have noticed this um, attribute here, which is the color interpolation filters. Um, what does this do? It is one of the most important attributes. It's not particularly like, like it's, I could have completely skipped this, but it is a very useful tip. Now, suppose you're inverting colors in the linear space, okay? The colors, when you're inverting, when you're doing any kind of color inversion, like the one we have here, uh, I have the image on the top and I'm inverting it. Now, I have two different results here. When you're inverting colors in the linear space, the colors tend to shift towards the brighter colors. The result, even though it's not technically wrong, it's not very desirable, and that is because of the way the human eye sees and handles colors. So, in other words, um, we, we tend to be able to recognize more darker shades than lighter ones. So, in other words, if you have the same color and you have very light versions of that color, all of those light versions end up looking more the same to us, kind of like white. So, the overall image effect looks too white. In order to fix that, you can switch from the linear RGB space to the sRGB space, which uses a curve to do the, the inversion. So you're leaning more towards the darker, uh, the darker versions of the shades, which our eyes prefer. So long story short, if you ever do any kind of color manipulation in SVG, it could be inversion or any other effect, if the colors look a little bit off and not the way you would want them to look, try using the color inter interpolation and switching from linear to sRGB and that might just fix it for you. Um, all of the demos that I showed in this talk are available in a code pen collection that I have here. I'm going to be providing a link to the slides as well so you can check all of them out. And I have two minutes to spare or am I two minutes over time? Oh, okay, cool. Well, that's it anyway, so thank you so much.